Hi, this is a documentary on the Kareem's, a sporting dynasty. Three generations, two sports, one family from Kenya. I would like to thank Cricket Kida for posting this on their YouTube channel. Kindly share and subscribe to this wonderful cricket channel that will give you a lot of exciting things to watch. In March 2012, the port town of Mombasa in Kenya honored the late Yusuf Karim by naming a road after him. The Yusuf Karim Road became one of the few roads in Kenya to be named after a sports person. Who was Yusuf Karim and why was he honored this way? Yusuf was the son of Ahmed and Sherbano Karim, recent migrants to Mombasa from Kutch in western India. My parents first came to East Africa in 1926. They came here as, as people from there were coming here. I think there was a green pasture in, 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 in Africa here. And most of our Asians, especially our community members, I remember, started coming to East Africa. Uh, they stayed here for a few years and then again, I think they went back to make sure that they wind up there and come back here. Then when they were, went back to Mumbai, that's where Yusuf was born in 1935. Ahmed Karim returned to these lanes of Mombasa's old town in 1937. By this time, his family had increased to include his sons, Ghulam Ali, Hussein Ali, Akbar Ali, Sultan Ali, Yusuf and Pyar Ali, and his daughters, Marzia and Fatima. During the, the, the war time, 40s, 41, Second World War, uh, he was with price control and basically, you know, those, at those times those Russian cheats were being issued. So he was in charge of that. After that, he got uh, a job. In other words, you know, my, my Fuima's family, they, were, they had a port canteen in port and they had an office in town here. So my father was looking after that town office here. Ahmed Karim was a member of the Ethnashari community, a Shia Muslim community from Kutch in the western coast of India. And his son Yusuf had learned his tennis on the cement courts of the community's club in Mombasa, now called the Jaffrey's Sports Club. All courts in Kenya, everywhere, were this, Moram clay. Uh, the only place where they did not have clay courts was on the coast, where Yusuf Karim played. He played on cement courts. In 1951, when he was just 17, Yusuf Karim won the men's singles title of the Mombasa Residents Tournament. This win had been predicted by many, as Karim had already reached the semi-finals of the tournament in the previous year. For fellow schoolboys, Yusuf Karim was already a known name. I was playing in my Aldina school. He was in a technical high school. So we used to meet on a cricket pitch. He was the best cricketer among our opponents. As a best man, we were only worried about him. Once we get Yusuf Karim, the team is busy. We will, we will walk through the team. He was captaining the... Mombasa schools and I was captaining the Nairobi schools and they used to have in those days a triangular Kisumu, Mombasa and Nairobi. So he captained the Mombasa side and we played against each other in Kisumu. Here was the new tennis champion of Mombasa, Yusuf Karim. This is the first tennis racket that he purchased from Datu auction for five shillings got it fixed and as you can see in the year 1951 when he was 16 that was his first trophy that he won. The following year Yusuf won a double crown and then a triple crown in the succeeding year. In 
It is very, very pleasing to be reminded of one's childhood and of one's boyhood by a young man who was not born then, but his father was a good friend of mine. And we both had the notoriety of going late always to the school. And we waited for each other. If Yusuf was there late, he waited for me. If I was late, I waited for him. And the headmaster, when they saw the two, he turned his face as if he did not know. We only pitied those who were punished. <laughs> but in any case, it is true. But you must not think that I was good at sports. My field was different, Yusuf Bai's field was different. Yusuf Bai remained course champion for 25 years. And I had just had a slight impact upon Mombasa as one of the so-called good orators produced by the school. Debaters and so on. As my senior at Technical High School, he was greatly admired by his fellow students, the teachers and the principal at that time, Mr. Andy Patel, because of his prowess in sports. There were two such persons at Technical High School who enjoyed a lot of respect from the students, the staff and the principal of the high school. One was Mr. Askar M. M. Jaffa, who was a great orator and he rose to become the world president of the international community. The second one was Yusuf. I still remember that if for any good reason Yusuf or Askar came to the school a bit late, the principal would turn a blind eye. A secondary st student becoming a course champion, it was a big honor. The history of tennis in those days is governed very much by the Europeans. The highest level here um, was, was probably county level in Britain. Uh, Rusty Mayers got through to the third round at Wimbledon. It was an elitist sport in some ways and the indigenous Africans did not participate in tennis. Clubs were of course very much on racial lines. I remember him from about the mid-50s and that also at what was then the Isnashiri Sports Club. He was one of the leading sportsmen there. One would see him playing cricket, tennis, volleyball, traditional style volleyball. These three mainly. First of all, he had an aura. I mean, so even if you are st uh, sitting any part of the ground, and you know, and he used to bat number four. That was his like registered uh, place uh, number. So he used to uh, up his sleeves and uh, his bat, and he had a very unique walking style. And you know, uh, it's like a, somebody with authority walking out too. Bet. He walked chest out, he was blessed with a very good build, so he stood out, put it this way. You could not but notice him on the field. Uh, uh, very well dressed, immaculately, flannels when the rest of the players always sported whites. He would have a sort of a, a creamish look about his trousers, I still remember. In those days it was very f uh, popular to wear a cap as opposed to these white uh, hats these days. So he, he looked a perfect uh, a dream player uh, visually to a spectator. He had certain mannerisms that when he did play a shot, I would see him sort of do that sort of thing. And we, we remember that. And of course, he had a commanding build, so it sort of added up to that. He was interested in driving that ball. Okay, he shots, his runs were fours driven past the covers, past the long on, past the mid on. In my team, in our team, in our 11, we, me and Yusuf, were the only two recognized batsmen. 
the others were there, but there would be a, just a support. If either of us gets out quicker, the team would not score. In fact, I played together with him. This was uh, in the in the late 60s in the in the late 70s. He had still an aura about himself, and uh, I saw. In fact, he got a chance to bat, and uh, he, he hit some amazing shots, even without any practice. I'll tell you about his father, Yusuf's father. He would be present at the cricket ground an hour before the match. He was himself a cricketer, his father. Yes. And whenever Yusuf would not score runs, his father would have a word to say to him. As he, no, no, I mean, as he was coming into the pavilion or something like that. He would get disappointed if uh, Yusuf Karim would come back uh, earlier than that century. After completing his education in 1952, Yusuf joined the family business, a sports shop in Old Town, Mombasa. That is where the first Karim's family business started, Akbarabai. He was the man who started the business and then when Yusuf finished his school, he joined. In spite of the many hours spent at work, Yusuf's reign as Mombasa's tennis champion continued unabated. And then he was champion, 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 champion right through. His singles, he partnered uh, Amy, Amy Vienna in the doubles and they won a lot of trophies together. And then he partnered Mrs. Norona in the mixed doubles and she won there as well. He had a control service but he rarely double faulted for one. And uh, I mean when playing a shot, he would be very, very canny about the corners, playing the ball deep. And then being at halfway stage to be able to sort of put it away again. While succeeding at tennis, Yusuf Karim delivered outstanding performances on the cricket field as well. He was a class above all other batsmen. There were other good batsmen. I'm not uh, you know, taking away anything from the other batsmen. But he was a complete batsman. He had the patience. He had the power to accelerate the innings. He had the power to hit sixes. In my opinion, he was a very good batsman. And uh, if he had played more cricket, concentrated more on cricket, I think he would have gone very far in cricket in the same fashion the way his son Asif Karim went very far from playing for Kenya. The most that has been talked about is against the MCC uh, when Mike Watkins came in 1957-58 around that time and, and he played glorious uh, cricket against them and was immediately offered uh, county cricket. Well, county cricket in those days was a major issue. Means you're first being respected by an outside community playing in England, playing at the highest level. He was offered a contract to play county cricket after the MCC uh, visit to Mombasa. Yeah, and at that time, the grandfather had, re had refused to allow him to, to, to leave, you know, Mombasa. And it was, I think, beyond comprehension at that time to really think of going to England when, when going from Mombasa to Nairobi was a major exercise. Yusuf Bai was born in a wrong country. Had he been born in a test playing country, he would have been. He would have played test. And to add to that, I would say that uh, as far as Mombasa is concerned, uh, there hasn't been a greater batsman than Yusuf Bai, and I don't think there ever will be. He moved on to have his own shop, I think it was in 1957 or 58. So the sports shop and a little bit of insurance was, was being done because he was very well known. But up to 1975, the shop was the main business. One day when I went to buy a cricket ball, he said, what do you do? I said, uh, I'm an all-rounder. So uh, what, what do you bowl? I said, I bowl left arm. So good. He said, okay, I'm giving you this ball and uh, I'm making a knot here. But if you win the game, then you don't pay anything. And we won the game. That gives us an impetus. Today we don't have to pay for the ball if you win, you know. In those days, four shillings something, four fifty something was a lot of money. On the 10th of June, 1960, 
Yusuf married Nargis from the respected Kimji family of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. Those days, uh, not like today's generation that we have that love, uh, love marriages and love by first sight and these sort of things. It was sort of a, uh, an arranged marriage. Ne kisi ne bola ke lardki achi mere husband ko ne. To fir isne kabool kiya, fir hamari engagement hui, fir June mein shaadi hui. Sixty-one mein Arif born hua, me third. In spite of being married to a famous sportsman, Nurgis Karim never got a chance to watch from the stands when her husband played tennis. Na na, not allowed. Amara laga on ladies na jai chua. Kabache. However, Nurgis Karim found a way to watch her husband play by peeping through the thatched boundary wall of the Mvita Tennis Club. Three days after Kenya's independence, Yusuf and Nurgis were blessed with a second son, who they named Asif. Yusuf's winning streak continued at amateur tennis, but it did not provide an income for him and his growing family. Na na ti pa idigul si ni kung gusto mo niya, apre jain ni ay kapil. Kone shock na wii. Tayo na tapo isa sa si bas. An po tungo jati ti dar eslam bus ma travel kurti si. Jaon ni may mga pasyal to bus ma jati ti pila. But it's time when you carry a plane, my business is tiny, yeah, but it's so cool. Like in everywhere else, there are ups and downs, financially, business. But no, she, she gave him all the support. And of course, without that support, he would not have been able to do what he did. Yusuf and Nurgis rented an apartment in this building near the Mvita Club. By this time, Yusuf Karim had earned the title of King of the Cement Courts in Kenya. There were times that he used to cramp up and, and uh, wriggle in pain and quickly have uh, you know, a drink with salt in it and he had salt tablets, but mostly just salt and mix it in the drink and uh, have it. Yusuf played tennis at a time when Asian players encountered signs like this. Ironically, he had defeated the top European players of the day and was well respected. First time, you know, you met this guy with his fit, pretty dark skinned, uh, very good pair of legs, stocky legs, and he could run forever. Yusuf had played cricket for his club since 1948 and was Mombasa's tennis champion since 1951. But it was only in 1965 that his home club, the Jaffrey Sports Club, named him Sportsman of the Year. However, that same year, Yusuf retired from all forms of cricket. There was talk that he'd even left the Jaffrey Sports Club. Justice was not done to him on, in cricket. As a, as a batsman, he deserved to play. I would not know honestly, very honest with you, the reason why. But he's played very less representative games. Like especially the Asian European that we used to the play. Post Asian versus Europeans. Europeans. More than the club, I think it was the people who were in the selection committee. Even if the club fought hard, but if the selection committee had their, uh, there were five selectors in those days, I think, and if the three had already ganged up then. The worst part was every selector, you ask him individually, would say that uh, Yusuf would walk into any side. So the, for, for me, the enigma was, then why he's not in the side, you know? There were some, some real politics being played in the club because he was on top and he was a very sort of firm believer in discipline in this one. So a number of players were against him. Jealous, you would call it jealous. So he thought that uh, with all these things, let's, let me leave cricket. 
I would rather prefer not to comment on that. Please, if you allow me to. Absolutely. You, yeah. you know best what to yeah. talk and what not to talk. Yeah. Okay. But he did surely retired prematurely. Did he have more cricket in him? Oh, definitely. He had a lot of cricket in him. He had mixed feelings on his memories on cricket because uh, you must remember in those days you play for a community club. Uh, and uh, sadly to say that really he didn't have much support uh, from his own club. Uh, and when I compare this with uh, Chandrakant Patel, who used to play for Costume Kana, being from Mombasa, having said that they are treated uh, second rated, had huge support from his community, had huge support from his club, went on to captain uh, the Kenya team when they went to South Africa in 1956. Now here is uh, Yusuf Karim who is regarded one of the uh, great batsmen the cost has produced. In his short career, scored over 18 centuries, was a regular feature, yet he didn't get much support from uh, within his uh, club. Could Yusuf Karim have left the Jaffrey Sports Club? If you thought of moving, the pressure of the community on the individual and the family was too much. If you are a good player, you could not leave the club. In 1969, Yusuf Karim's accomplishments on the tennis courts won him the coveted Dunlop Vaz for Player of the Year from the Kenya Lawn Tennis Association. In spite of their differences, Yusuf led Jaffrey Sports Club to victory in the Macmillan Cup in 1972. In Mombasa, it's only the Jaffrey JSC who has won that trophy and that was with Yusuf Karim being our captain. The distinct memory I have is for the, the 1974 Davis Cup uh, in Nigeria where they went to play on Simon Court. Unfortunately he was not selected but he was a, a, a great sportsman he never complained and uh, you know he said he, he accepted the situation as it was. And funny enough six months or about eight months later there was all Africa games in Egypt where the surface was Maram uh, which he was not uh, very very familiar or very strong uh, in compared to the cement and then he gets uh, selected uh, so he was even debating whether to go or not and obviously uh, as a young guy I just wanted him to, to be everywhere. He partnered uh, Jane Davis who was uh, one of the top players in, in, in those days and uh, they were paired as mixed doubles partners and in the men's doubles was uh, Nalin Shreta who was his very good, uh, good old friend and of course the singles so they did very well in the mixed doubles having finished uh, as bronze medals. Meanwhile, the junior Kareems, Arif and Asif, had started to play tennis at the Mvita Tennis Club. Asif and I used to go and just knock the ball uh, somewhere in the side courts over there. Asif was about seven or eight year old. He and his elder brother Arif, they used to come with these small rackets and they would always play on the last court. And those two brothers always used to quarrel. Every time they quarrel and then they walk out of the court. <laughs> you know, this guy says the ball was out. The other brother says this is in. <laughs> Coming back to the, the Saturday 4 o'clock tennis, there was another reason why we used to go early. Because I would pester my dad. But, you know, at least let me hit a ball against, you know, A, my father, B, a, a superstar. So, you know, he would kind of knock with me and tease me around and make me run. And so by the time the 10, 15 minutes, I already need a drink. All the while, Yusuf still maintained his business of Kareem's sports house. In my involvement with the uh, Red Cross, he on many occasions would give a donation from his sports house, Kareem's sports house, some shirts for football and uh, football themselves and uh, other equipment. In 1974, Yusuf and Nargis Karim's financial affairs transformed thanks to the oil refinery in Mombasa. When we got that contract, 
Um, mom had to get involved because she was an excellent cook. And, yeah, and he was running the shop, but he was also involved in taking her there. You know, the, the, they used to split the time between the shop and the canteen. And slowly I started getting in, involved also and going with her on Saturdays sometimes. Every day, uh, I think they had to supply uh, tea, about 200, 250 cups in the morning, and coffee in the afternoon, the same number of uh, cups. And then a lot of uh, staff would come and have lunch. During those days, uh, for a for a for a lady in our community to, to work wasn't that common. A lot of eyebrows were uh, brought up, but my dad and mom were very focused. They were interested to get make a life for themselves and for their children. The canteen business actually gave a financial boost to to the family, and uh, things started to get better financially. By this time. Yusuf Karim's body was showing signs of wear and tear due to a lifetime of playing on cement courts. For cement courts, there are special shoes with special padding. So your knees, you know, the jerk that you get is not that severe on your knees. We didn't know that. We had very little knowledge. You know, we would just play tennis as just to go and play tennis. A couple of years before, he was not very keen to continue because he had elbow problem uh, and had knee problems, you know, because of the wear and tear and the lifestyle and all those other things. But I distinctly remember pushing him. I said, no, 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 you've got two more years, you have to get to 25. You are able and capable. And, and I used to keep on, if you can use the word, pester him, that I didn't want him to retire. I said, you get to 25 years, then yes, you retire. Whilst his reign as champion continued, Yusuf turned his attention to up-and-coming players by organizing tennis tournaments for junior players. I said, Dad, why don't, uh, doesn't the coast organize a tournament? And he was actually actively involved at the time, and he said, why not? And then he took it up from there, and that's how the whole thing started. I think it was called the Mombasa Junior Tennis Championships at the Vita Club. And that's where I went down with a whole group of uh, uh, boys and girls from Nairobi. That first tournament I played in, and in the finals I beat the top uh, Kenya player under 12, uh, was Ian Karanja. So I remember it was a Sunday morning uh, finals, uh, 9 o'clock start, uh, and there was a huge crowd supporting. And, and so I think that was the beginning of sense of belief. In 1977, Yusuf Karim played his 25th final of the Mombasa Residence Tournament against his eldest son, Arif. He was actually deciding not to play in the tournament, but his friends and us, of course, were pushing him to do it, and he actually took match by match. And in the semis, he actually was on the verge of just saying, no, I can't carry on any anymore. And we said, no, Dad, come on, come on, do it, you can do it. Because it was the 25th, we actually urged him on and he went on, he made it through to the final. I witnessed that match and uh, the match was good and of course uh, it, went, it went into a three-setter match. He had the guile and the wisdom and of course the experience. I was just a 16-year-old kid. I had stamina but he had the experience. The person must be something, right? And for 25 years, so even if he started at the age of um, 16, when he first won his tournament, now you are over 40, about 43. So just imagine, right, at 43 you are still able to carry what you were doing in your 16 and 23 and all that. He won and, uh, you know, yes, I lost in the finals, but... It was worth it. I remember Yusuf by raising his hand when he won that. I can't forget that. Definitely, yes. He raised both his hand with his racket in hand to complete that. I think that's a world record.
Despite their father's retirement, Arif ensured the Mombasa residence trophy remained in the Kareem family. Oh, he was, you know, again happy and, you know, from then on he just basically was ecstatic and happy every time uh, Asif or myself did well. His second son, Asif, was also getting serious about sports as he entered secondary school. I remember my first tournament was in 1977, uh, August, it was in Nairobi club. I had never even seen a Maram court. I was just uh, under 14 in the Kenya Open semi-finals. Uh, and Kush and myself uh, met for the first time. And I still remember that match, it was uh, in the morning hours. And again, we had a huge pack because he was the new kid on the block. Uh, in the junior tennis and fortunately uh, for me I won that match uh, and then played the next uh, national champion Dele Young who again we are still good friends since those days uh, and, and I won the tournament so my first tournament in Nairobi uh, in the Nairobi club I won under 14 and then the Kenya Open under 14. His biggest asset was, was his mind you know at that age uh, all of us were all these uh, you know you'd uh, like a youngster have all your flashy shots but also would wasn't so much into the flashy shots. He would use his mind and he understood the game well. And he read the game very well. In 1979, Asif won the Mombasa Residence Championship when he was just 16, matching his father's record at the same age. Just like his father, Asif was also beginning to excel at cricket. Asif was then selected for the Kenya cricket team. In 1979, we had a, a Zambia Metropolitan Club visiting Mombasa. In such matches, the club would invite three or four uh, big players oh. from Nairobi. The big players that, that came in was uh, Zulfikar Ali, Azar Sheikh and uh, Bob Musa, who used to play for Sarali Club and there were mega names right. in the country at that time, especially Zulfikar Ali. Now in walked in Mr. Tarzan Patel. So I spoke to the captain, I said, look, do you have somebody who, who can just throw a little ball in the air, you know, somebody, left armor. He says, we have a young boy here called Asif, but he doesn't ball for the team. I mean, he's just a guy who balls for the second team and he comes and plays in the nets and he balls occasionally. Because it's just, I don't care whoever it is, just bring him on. So he gave, threw the ball to Asif. So at last over before lunch, he tosses the ball to me. So, you know, obviously they, they set the filling up and everything is there. To annoy Mr. Patel even further, I set a field for Asif and Asif looked at me and he, he, he didn't know what was happening. I sort of set a field where we crowded him. And Tarzan was, was not used to this, you know, because he used to hit big sixes and, you know, the minute he would walk in, he'd expect the field to spread and all that. So I come in and bowl the, the first ball. And Zulfi Karali stands in the slips, you know, that's, that was his position. So he watches me ball the second ball and the guy starts making animations, you know. Like, you know, wh what am I watching here? And I bowled the third one and I bowled uh, to Raghuvir Patel, who used to play for Kenya before and then moved to Zambia. And, I, and Zulfi Karali caught him in the slips. As destiny would have it, he touched this ball, probably spun a bit more and I took the catch at short point. So obviously we all going to lunch. And then Zulfikar, you know, he says, who is this boy? And I mean, you know, all of a sudden, he, all the eyes were on me. Uh, you know, I'm, I didn't know whether to, to blush or to, to feel good or to feel what. And he says, no, 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 I want you to play for Sarali Club. Now, when Zulfikar really talks to you, it's a novelty on its own. Then he tells you to play for his club. It was a major issue. So I said, no, no, I, I can't. I mean, I've got to talk to my parents or to the club. And, you know, that was the structure, uh, structure then. So anyway, now all of a sudden, now the whole eyes are on me. So we go back on the field and now I bowl consistently. I remember Asif taking, f picking up five wickets and uh, I could actually see Zulfi Karali uh, stay close to him, talk to him every, after every over. Second innings, they, they go to bed and I think I came on the fourth or fifth over bowling and I picked six wickets. So I picked ten wickets in that match and we won the match. And all of a sudden now, so Zulfi Karali says, no, 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 this boy has got to play for me. And I mean, I see a, a big star here in the making for this country. So obviously I'm on cloud nine, you know, I mean, here is you know, the guy that you're admiring is just talking about you. I mean, I was so impressed with this boy. I mean, his flight is, you know, at his such a young age, he was a very slim boy, tall and very fit, I think. I think he used to play tennis as well. 
but I had never seen him before, I had never met him before. But the way he bowled... I'm During that period, uh, Chiranjeev and Harry actually saw Asif Karim for the first time. And not, not as a batsman, but as a bowler. So he came in, and this is the first time, and they said, the first comment was, what a loop. You know, these are people who can spot talent. And the mere fact, they said, how many bowlers have this loop? So Harry said, you watch, this boy is going to play for the country. And Mombasa Sports Club, who are playing in the National League, approached my dad, who was uh, late for Krubabla, who really was an inspiration to me uh, later on. Came to my dad with uh, Mushtaq Ramji, and they said, look, we would like your son to, to play for Mombasa Sports Club in the National League. Now, I was doing my O-levels, which was a very important year for me. Uh, so we had a discussion, and of course, my parents, as usual, was very, very supportive. And he says, this is an opportunity for you. Go ahead. In some ways, I, I agree with what he did moving to sports club. Because Mombasa Sports Club was Mombasa's representative team on the National League. And that gave him exposure. And obviously, the exposure paid off. He would not have had that exposure had he uh, play, continued to play for Jafferies. It meant travelling almost every week to Nairobi to play because it was a home and away basis. So I had a very good season for, for the club. Asif was then selected for the Kenya cricket team. And again I was put in the national squad immediately, uh, in the squad of 30 in those days. And there was a trip to Zimbabwe. The team was selected, I was on the reserve. I was not, of course, I was disappointed. But, you know, I should not have expected too much out of that. A week before the tour, one of the left-arm spinners gets injured. Asif was selected and I took the opportunity of phoning his father and telling him that Asif has been selected. My dad receives a call in Mombasa to say, look, your son needs to go to, to Zimbabwe. And I said, wow. The first day we practice and the team is announced and I'm put in the team. So very exciting feeling that now he's making a debut for the country. So the captain Ramesh Patel gives me the ball. And who's batting that time? I didn't even know who was batting. And Duncan Fletcher was batting. So I come in to bowl him the first ball and he takes a swing, gets a top edge and I get a wicket. And everybody's screaming, wow, wow, win a wicket on debut. Again, didn't mean anything to me in those days. But it was a major issue that you get a wicket of the first delivery. It was on this tour of Zimbabwe that players of African origin were first included in the national team, changing the face of cricket in Kenya forever. In 1980, Asif was named as the upcoming cricketer of the year by the Kenya Cricket Association. By this time, Asif had established himself as a force in junior tennis. His crowning glory came with his victory in the Bjorn Borg Trophy. Bjorn Borg Trophy is uh, something that's played once a year where the top 16 juniors are uh, the top 16 of the country play uh, in, a, in a singles tournament. After winning the tournament, I got the opportunity to go to Europe uh, to, to play the ITF junior circuit. In 1981, Asif was named as the Sportsman of the Year by the Mombasa Sports Club. It was the third honour that year. Shortly afterwards, Asif was accompanied by his parents as he played in the ITF junior tennis circuit in Europe. He volunteered to, to be my manager coach for this, this trip and my mom joined uh, on that uh, trip along. So we went on this trip to, to Europe uh, where we had to travel to Germany, Belgium, Italy, France uh, where I fortunately managed to play the French Open in uh, 1981. And I must admit that there was a huge eye-opener for me to realize that the standard of tennis that we have in Kenya is way, way low. I was outplayed in all the, all the matches. Uh, I lost in first round in every tournament. Now here is a young boy who lived in his cocoon in Mombasa. The highest he went to was to Nairobi. So now you're going to a world and then you realize that you know, there's a huge world out there. Upon returning from Europe, Asif left for further studies in the United States of America, following the path of his elder brother, Arif. 
Tennis has been a very strong feature in our family. My brother also was a, was a tennis champion in Mombasa and then I followed him. And both of us, due to tennis, managed to get a four-year tennis scholarships in the United States. As I was finishing, you know, I talked to uh, Mr. Fakwar about uh, Asif, got his information and records in and, and fortunately he also got a scholarship over there. It's a small town, Lake Worth, about an hour's drive from uh, Miami. The teammates we had were cosmopolitan. Soon after joining college, Asif realized that he had to overcome some financial challenges. I knew the challenges my parents were going through, so where is an area that I can raise some money? And then an opportunity came with one of the person that I was coaching, and I said, look, I need to you know, see if I can get some work. Uh, I mean, I've got, I'm, I'm eager to, to earn some money. So she organized a job for me uh, in a vegetarian restaurant uh, as a busboy. In America, a busboy is somebody who works in a restaurant that after the, the, the patrons have eaten, you go on to the table, you pick up all the dishes and you take it into the kitchen. And that is followed at the end by cleaning up the entire uh, restaurant and as the uh, restroom would close, I would go to the toilets, clean the toilets up, uh, go to the kitchen uh, when everybody is gone, remove all the mats, uh, clean the whole kitchen up, put it back uh, in need. And I used to take a lot of pride in what I was doing. You know, it, it, it taught me a lot of things. But the icing to that whole job was that I used to get a free meal. And we would hear news, you know, of, uh, of our team, how, we are, how well we are doing. And we would hear how well West Palm Beach is doing amongst the colleges of Florida. The West Palm Beach is always uh, in top five. So he was playing for a very good college. With their eldest sons away at university, Yusuf and Nergis Karim completed the Hajj pilgrimage in 1982. As you start your second year, uh, now you've got to start looking at moving to a university, which would be the third year of a university for a four-year university. So one of the areas that, that interested me was insurance. Now, Howard University was one of the very few universities in the U.S. that offered an insurance uh, program at the undergraduate level. So I applied for them and they were also interested in me uh, because of the tennis and I was very keen uh, to go to another city I wanted to go to Washington because you know you always hear about it when you are in Mombasa that you know Washington DC is the capital of the United States how it is no more different than other historical black colleges you know uh, 400 years ago uh, we had slavery all right and during the slavery years blacks could not go to white institutions they decided that it was going to have our own facilities for education since we couldn't go to white schools Palm Beach Junior College was predominantly a white school. Right. When I was in Florida, it was a predominantly a white school. So as an, as an Asian, as an Indian, we are in the middle, whichever way you go. Unless you go to India, then you are part of the, the system. But other than that, any part in the world, you are going to be a minority. Asif soon made his mark on the tennis courts of Howard. He even found fellow cricket players in Washington, D.C. They selected a team uh, for Washington 11 to go to Jamaica for a week and I was selected in that trip and here is the West Indies that you are hearing about the Clive Lloyds and the Viv Richards and the Michael Holdings and, and all that now you are going to visit that country and I remember again bowling to Basil William who had just played for the West Indies and again uh, I don't know whether I'm knack to get those big wickets but I got him out on the third ball. On his visits home from Howard University Asif continued to make headlines in the Kenyan press. Asif celebrated his 21st birthday by getting a perm, in keeping with the style at that time. And I walk into the, to the hairdresser lady and she says, yes, what can I do for you? And I said, look, I would like to get a perm, but can you explain to me you know, how this thing works? I think I was there for at least three hours. I mean, it was an experience and a half. You know, they put rollers on you and there's liquids on you. And, and, and after I finish the whole saga, it stinks. And then you are told that for one day, you're not going to shower. So I said, but I'm smelling. He says, it's okay, go through it tonight. So the next day is when I shower and, and then the whole thing comes out and then you see uh, a nice little bomb uh, on 21. He did change his hairstyle when he came back. I remember that. Uh, he did that Afro type of thing. <laughs> yes, I remember that. Howard Wood to me was the defining moment for me in my life. Uh, that two and a half years experience in, in that university the tennis that I played, the high level of tennis that I went through, the high level of training that I went through, the people I met, the studies I did. When he came back from America, he was much faster on the court, very fast thinker. He would straight away know uh, how to 
react to that ball or the point which, which is coming in. In 1985, Asif permanently returned home to Mombasa and the Mvita Tennis Club. I came back in 85 December after graduating and I was offered a job with uh, Alico, American Life Insurance Company in Nairobi. I started my job uh, in April and obviously the cricket and uh, tennis also were simultaneously in place. Asif played with the Kenya team in the 1986 ICC Associates Tournament where Tom Ticolo became the first player of African origin to lead the national cricket team. Kenya finished a poor 10th out of 14 participating teams. It was around the same time that his brother Arif got married and migrated to England. After marriage, as I said, I was, I was there until uh, August of 86 in, in Mombasa. And, no, then we migrated to the UK because I had a British overseas passport and had to move. Would the brothers have played together nationally? Well, obviously, I mean, you know, to have uh, my brother be part of the Davis Cup team or to the national cricket team uh, would have been a, a, a great thing. Later that year, Arif and Asif played for opposing sides at a community festival in Nairobi. Arif for Stanmore in England and Asif for Nairobi in Kenya. Well, I actually thought that Nairobi will be because I think both the players are in Kenya squad today. As predicted by Yusuf Karim, Asif's team won the tennis and cricket tournament. Asif continued his good form in tennis, inviting comparisons with his illustrious father. The only thing that used to distract Asif, or in my opinion, was the fact that he was a very emotionally charged person, much more than his father. 1987 was the All Africa Games. I mean, it was a prestigious thing that Kenya was hosting it, and tennis was one of the, one of the disciplines that was going to be taking part. Paul Wakesa at that time was, was the number one, and so he didn't have to play in the trials. And then we had Ino Polo, myself, Asif, and Norbert Odwar, and a few others who were, who were also there. So Ino and myself went through, and, uh, and I believe it came down to Asif playing against Norbert Odwar. For the fourth position, you know, and, and uh, between the two of us, and and I won the match. Obviously the selectors were a little jittery and you could sense something was not right and they said, no, no, we would like you to play again because we want to check the fitness and it's a very important tournament. So fine. So we play again that afternoon and again I beat him. Only an hour or two hours later when the selection is mentioned in front of everybody, no but a door is selected in front of me. And it was one of the most disappointing uh, thing to go through, but there was nothing you could do. I was never involved in that. I always just used to come like a week before the, the actual match uh, commenced, so I didn't have anything to do with trial. And again, it was a scenario of a Mombasa boy coming to Nairobi and being discriminated. A disappointed Asif retreated to his parents' home and the Mvita Tennis Club. I was about 10 years old and uh, I was very keen on tennis and my father was keen on me playing tennis and what my father did was he actually uh, spoke with Asif and asked him can you please take a, a little bit of time out of your busy schedule and I tugged him on the shirt and I was like Asif please uh, could you please hit with me and I just remember the, the fluidity I just remember him being in, in such in, incredible control and had a great a grace and an elegance. Three four months later uh, Kenya is drawn to play Davis Cup against Ghana and Ghana is on the coast, so the entire squad travels to Mombasa for training. And I had a, a very honest and a very frank discussion with the coach. And I said, look, we know there's a, a position for one that, that really is being tussled here for. Are we going to go through the same saga, what we went through in Africa? So we play a, a best of five matches between Norbert and myself, and I won the match. So obviously I felt good. The next morning I come to the hotel where we were training, and as I walk into that room, I immediately sensed a feeling of something is not right and, and I got that fear that, that there's a shocker coming. You know there was a bit of political evil at that time, you know, they, they, we were all trying to um, make tennis a much more widespread game. I mean I myself was the chairman here, we were having, we were having um, grassroots programs and things and um, Norbert Odo was probably the first Ken black Kenyan player, I'm saying, and um, at that time he was not an Asif standard. I mean, we saw it. Asif beat him all the time, but at the same time he was chosen. It was, a, I think, it was a political 
move? Uh, I wouldn't put it down to uh, the ac Africanization, but I just felt we had a few people who were running the committee at that time like it was their own personal kingdom. And that really was very, very disheartening and, and, and uh, like anybody else, I mean, you know, you worked hard, you want to play for the country, it's a pride to play for your nation, you, you are not asking for a favor. You've gone through the whole rigma that everybody else has gone through and then you get dropped. In an effort to overcome his dejection, Asif now focused his attention on cricket. I remember 87, if I'm not wrong, when we went to Mombasa and um, we were playing against the Indian Stars. They had Roger Beanie, Ven Saka, uh, uh, Kapil Dev was there. That is the match when Asif was bowling to Ven Saka and I was in slips and uh, he bowled a beauty of a delivery and I just, you know, took the catch. And uh, those days, you know, nobody, no spinner would bowl to Ven Saka. You know, he was very risky, but you know, and I think the whole series, Asif, Asif really bowled very well. He was uh, my idol, okay. He was a guy you would put in more than 100% into a match. That's why he would perform, and that's where I picked up uh, a lot from him. I actually used to call him King. I didn't see any interaction with females with Asif. I don't know anything about his love life before he married. I had a theory that I had traveled enough. Uh, I had done my studies. I felt within myself that if something came up, it's fine. You know how the Indian uh, uh, culture is. Uh, the family's friends or friends of families, they, they, they try and uh, see that who the prospective uh, candidate for, you know, uh, person is in their own ways you know they they made Nazdin known to the mother-in-law Asif's mother they met they chatted and she thought okay, maybe it is worth uh, Asif meeting uh, my, my, my sister we met at uh, Fazal's house our very good friend Zuli Fazal and Fatma Fazal so it was like an informal meeting and I think we just clicked it from that I think it was love at first sight I mean we met and we we, we spoke and, and we spoke like we knew each other for years my family had a fit of their life. They said, you are not going back to Africa. It's not safe. You're not going to get a boy from there. You know, because of the trauma we had in Uganda, he said, you're not coming back. So I said, no, I like this guy and I think it'll work. So my sister had to convince him. My mother was like, Phew, completely gone case. <laughs> Obviously, there was a lot of apprehension from her family side because, you know, they've experienced the Uganda saga. Uh, they're now living in England, well settled. Now you're talking about getting married to uh, okay, in in, back in Kenya and in a small town in Mombasa was a major issue. On the 28th of November 1987, Asif and Nazneen were married in Stanmore, England. Nazneen had qualified and was already working as a dispensing optician in London. Within a few weeks, Asif resumed his sporting activity. Since then, Nazneen dedicates her time to writing and social work. Two months later, we are now drawn against Egypt to be played in Egypt on Maram. So I'm invited again. Then I said, no, I don't think I want to. But I give max marks to my parents um, and Nazni, who pushed me. Kush and myself were selected. Paul was part of the team. But unfortunately, Wakesa had to be dropped on the 11th hour because he had played a South African. And at that time, we were not allowed to, to play a South African. So he was there with us as a team. As a, as, a, as a support. It was great playing with us. We, we had a lot of fun uh, where we were playing in the middle of a match and uh, both at net and his ball hit the cord and it actually hit him between his legs very, very hard. <laughs> and he was writhing in pain. And, and I was actually laughing because I, I just found this hilarious. I couldn't believe it. You know, you, you can imagine this scenario, a serious Davis Cup match and, you know, someone getting hit between the legs. In 1989, Asif and Nazneen were blessed with a daughter, who they called Fatima. She was born on the 24th of November, the same day as her mother. In Mombasa, Asif achieved a hole-in-one in golf, a sport he had recently started playing. That is a record here, that he did not get a handicap, but still he got first hole-in-one. I played golf with Zahir Abbas, and I mentioned to him, because Zahir... Uh, uh, has visited Kenya with, uh, with the Pakistan A team as a manager. Zahir is a good tennis player as well, so probably he didn't know much about Asif. So he asked him for a game of, uh, of uh, tennis and Asif, I know his humility, he gave him a point in every set, right? 
So I'm sure Zaid still thinks he's very good. So when I told uh, about Asif Kareem, oh, that khabba. I said, of course, that khabba. He said, that two in one. He said, no, it's three in one. He said, why? He said, it is not only uh, cricket and uh, tennis. He got a hole in one in golf also. And Zaid was that. Oh. <laughs> in 1990, Asif played with the Kenya cricket team in his second ICC Associates Tournament in Holland. We had never finished fourth. And uh, we, we got up to the semi-finals. And in that game, had rain not saved Holland, and that is a fact, Kenya was going to be in its first ever finals. What for us was the achievement that we now had reached the world stage. Upon his return to business in Mombasa, Asif felt the corporate world of Nairobi beckoning. When the chairman of the club, Nashad Merali, who was a business magnet uh, and the chairman of the Samir group of companies, and myself decided to start this company because there was something that was lacking in his group. You know, he had a uh, number of companies, but it was insurance that was not there and it was perfect for me. By this time, Asif's younger brother, Altaf, had left for the United States of America for further studies. Asif and Nazneen's decision to leave the family home in Mombasa raised much concern as it also meant leaving their parents. I said, I have a chance to go to Nairobi. So, I said, I'm going to go. My father-in-law was very supportive of this. He said, look, you have an opportunity, go for it. Asif's relocation was the subject of a television documentary made by the Kenya Broadcasting Corporation. He's quite the most outstanding player that we've had on the coast. I think his record with Kenya goes without saying. He's batted and bowled against the best players at international level and proved his worth. And uh, in my honest opinion, uh, if he'd have been born in, say, Pakistan or England, or he'd had the chance to have gone and played in first-class cricket, although one can never be absolutely certain I do feel that uh, he would have made an impact at that level, that is first class level, particularly with his bowling. I think his uh, main contribution is the fact that he provides a yardstick for the junior players. Um, they play each other, they beat each other, they think they're getting pretty good, and then they get on the, co uh, the court against Asif and uh, they find that they still have quite a long way to go. He's been the champ of Mombasa tennis for the past, past decade, and all of us juniors have been trying to beat him. But now that he's leaving, I mean, he's left a big gap. In Nairobi, Asif's twin passions of tennis and cricket finally collided. Now here is a final of cricket on a Sunday, and here is a final of tennis. Can you open? What do I do? And that same very weekend, we are shifting houses. I say to myself, okay, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go 9 o'clock to the ground as the captain toss the coin, hope to win the toss so that we bat. So then I go back to Nairobi club to play the Kenya Open, which, which will be about 10, 30, 11, finish that singles, and then rush back to the cricket, finish the cricket. Not to forget, I was also in the doubles finals, which was at 5 o'clock in the evening. So I go to the ground win the toss, we go to bed, immediately I leave, give instructions and I go to the Kenya Open. Unfortunately, the lady singles got delayed. So the time now is going and every minute was valuable. So then we start the men's uh, singles and I don't think I was in the right mental frame and I lost to Norbert Odor in the final. Uh, rushed back to the ground and we are in dire stress, we are at about 100 for 7. So I walk in and we are about 143 or thing all out. We go to the field. Aga Khan, whom we were playing against, were now in a precarious position. They were about 100 for, for 6. I still had 4 overs to ball. It's now 4 o'clock. I have to rush for the finals. So now what do I do? And I just said, made a decision that, look, I cannot let my team down. So I went through. Unfortunately, we won't lost the cricket match. I go back to Nairobi Club for the finals and it was the most embarrassing sight when everybody is giving me a horrible look because I'm late. And I felt very disappointed that I let my doubles partner down. But he, he, he was okay at the end. And maybe he was just being respectful for me. But I felt disappointed. But it was a day that really went completely haywire. The time had come when Asif had to choose between tennis and cricket. He gave up tennis in favor of cricket. 
He was a very, very talented player and uh, he, he was not chosen for the Davies Cup team. I was disheartened with, uh, with my own uh, um, decision on the tennis. I mean, I'm not blaming anybody on that. It was a, it was a tough decision. Asif is still fondly remembered by his teammates. It wasn't the power game. And I think uh, this is what uh, Asif lacked. He, you know, as tennis has progressed, it's become more of a power game. Um, people are more physical, they hit harder, and uh, he, he, he had that old game from the 60s, 70s, where it was all very nice touch and feel. Well, the reason why it's difficult to beat him, first, I think uh, the guy is sort of a tennis genius. I mean, he's quite good, he's quite a steady player. He's fast on the court. Even though he's not, I mean, he's not that a uh, hard hitter, he doesn't hit the ball hard. But the thing is, he's quite good at, at controlling the ball. He keeps on returning everything till one makes a mistake. As if uh, his game um, was centered around his ability to manipulate the ball uh, as a craft. Slice backhand which is possibly the best uh, in Kenyan history. Asif was known that if you hit to his backhand, it's going to be placed in the corner with a fair amount of spin and it, and it prevents you from doing much with the ball. dramatic events were happening in Asif's business life. In sometimes in 1993, Mr. Karim bought out the company from Samir Group. I think that was the best decision uh, that must have been made uh, by taking over the company. It gave me a lot of freedom, it gave me a lot of independence uh, because I've always been an independent person. I'd like to make decisions. When he bought out the company, it's like we didn't have an office. Just as was my office first. So I he moved into that office, and which he did well, and then he moved to Lighthouse. In 1992, Asif and Nazneen were blessed with a son, who they named Irfan. Since he was born, um, he was about two, one and a half, two. I would be bowling to him, playing cricket with him, because we had a very small flat. He would break windows, vases, and I just put everything away. Asif captained the Kenya team for the first time in 1993 leading them to victory over a test-playing country. I used to be vice-captain uh, on a regular basis. So I captained Kenya before I captained club. Those days, nobody talked about him as a captain yet. Uh, primarily because he had not captained, I don't think he did captain his own team. In 1994, Asif helped to procure equipment sponsorship for the Kenyan team for the first time. Cricket equipment being so expensive, a player couldn't buy his own gear. I had a word with uh, AJ Sports. I said, look, we're playing this tournament. Uh, it's going to do you good also because we have a good team. So fortunately, they agreed and that sponsorship at that time was worth well over $10,000. 20 teams came to Nairobi in 1994 for the ICC Associates Tournament. That time, it was do and die for Kenya. If Kenya performs well, if they achieve the status of being in the final or they finish runners-up, they had the opportunity to play in the World Cup. In those matches, the critical matches, we would have three to 5,000 people. And in the finals, we had over 12,000 people. I have never seen a crowd like that locally. In a lovely performance, the Kenyan score was 318 for the five wickets. And to do
he bowled beautiful well in the tournament. Um, we went on up to the finals. When we crossed the rope to go onto the ground, you could see that this was a united team, this was a one team, and the huge crowd support that we had, and the administration, everybody was clear that the focus is the World Cup. We had a set plan, we are playing in India. So what is the point of going and playing on green wicket in England? You go and our performance has to be that World Cup. Our preparation for the World Cup used to at least go to some other country before you, your team goes there. As part of their preparation for the World Cup, the Kenya team toured Bangladesh in 1995. When we beat them, we knocked them out of uh, contention for, for a place for the World Cup. So it was sort of like they wanted us to go to their own backyard and pay us back. We were playing in stadiums consisting of over 30,000 people watching. Uh, I mean, there was a time I distinctly remember when I was batting with my colleague, I think it was Edward Tito. And you know, when you're talking to each other, it's very easy to hear each other. In Nairobi or the normal cricket match, and here I'm talking to him and he can't hear me and I can't hear him. Wow. With all that noise of the 30,000, so we actually had to come next to each other in the middle of the wicket and, and you know, whatever we had to talk. I mean, it was amazing. And the, and the firecrackers and, and the noise. The conditions were very harsh because it was very hot, very humid. Yeah, the wickets were turning. So for people like Asif, I think the conditions suited him very well because he bowled very well on that series. We had a foursome group: me, Asif, uh, Edward Tito, and uh, Tariq Iqbal. Right. We were four of us used to be always hang around together, and uh, we used to love eating. That's the main pastime we had. How did Asif manage to balance the demands of business? sports and his young family. I would say it, it has suffered, I cannot lie, definitely. But uh, he, I think he made up for it towards, you know, when he comes in the evening, he makes sure at least he spends some time with them. Uh, unfortunately, I could not join him in any of the trips because it was always during school time. One thing Dad's really good at is balancing everything somehow. I mean, it, it was obvious he wasn't there when he was on tour and yeah, practicing, but I do remember that when I had a class assembly or parent-teachers interviews in school, he would normally be there. He did his time and the family, were, the family was with him, so very supportive, especially the wife, uh, Nazdeen, excellent supportive. I, he couldn't get a better person. It's, it's difficult for, for the wife to, you know, uh, give that kind of support because he used to be out two, three months, two, three months out playing cricket, playing cricket, playing cricket. One would get fed up saying, what's happening, you know? And um, it goes on. Uh, but Nazdin, wonderful person. Then in early 1996 came the Wills World Cup. Honestly speaking, going to the World Cup uh, for us, it was about going to take pictures, you know, standing next to Sachin, standing next to Lara. Yeah, this is the World Cup, you know, it's, it's our first time, uh, you know, taking part in such a, a big uh, event. We were playing uh, India in a big names, Azar, Sachin, Kumle, Srinath, Prabhakar, and we were playing in Katak. Huge, full house stadium. Uh, it was my 10th over and uh, Obviously, it was on 99, so Maurice and myself said, you know, let's try and put some pressure. But, you know, we are also asking ourselves that what pressure are we going to put on this guy when he's on 99? I mean, he scored these runs so fast. So we said, let's be a little uh, adventurous. Oh, they've asked the question. Everyone's holding that up and they cannot believe it. Well, I'd like to see that replay. Well, the Kenyans definitely thought they'd got Sachin Tendulkar here. Must have just come off the bat, but definitely uh, the decision going in favour of the batsman. I come in to bowl the first one, pushed it a little bit, and there was a, a catch on a bat and pad. And we made a huge appeal, you know, I mean, and there was a huge uproar in the crowd. Uh, and I remember, I can't remember the umpire's name, but it was a Sri Lankan. And I mean, the, it was deafening noise, you know, and now here is uh, Sachin Tendulkar getting his first hundred on, in a World Cup, 
he's on 99 we are in India I'm bowling the first ball and of course the umpire uh, gets a not out he was out he will put in, in a ledge at 99 caught by Hitesh Modi's short leg he was out he says he turned around and he just smiled at us he says umpires have to give me out I can't walk and uh, Asif says, my God, I must have, you know, there's a prize we get. Because every time when we sat down to eat, we always used to joke to each other. And we used to bat, you, who's going to get Tandurka's wicket? And Asif said, I'm going to get it. I said, no, 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 I'm going to get it. So Tito said, no, I'm going to get his wicket. I said, no, don't worry. So I keep bowling there and, and every ball, uh, Sachin struggles uh, to get a single. And I end up getting a maiden, and, and it was a very, very good feeling. Thinking back, you know, it, it brings a smile to my face that uh, it was our debut, and we actually managed to make the Indian press go against their own players. That if Kenya could do this, you know, what about these other teams? Again, Australia was uh, was a, another very hot area. We played in we played in Vizak, Vishakhapatnam, and I mean, it was extremely hot. Well. It's in the air, this will be caught. Oh yes, he's got him, easy. Ian Healy goes for 17 from just 11 balls faced. And it's 3-0-1 for 6. And again, he's going for that offside. In goes the throw and he gets the stumps and that's beautifully fielded. Stuart Law knew he couldn't get there. A 35 from 30, that's a nice little pipe opener for him. That's beautifully hit by Stuart Law and just out of reach. And on the ball... Glenn McGrath is another one who's well versed in the one day game. Asif got injured that match because Asif fell and hurt his knee and he really struggled then after that. Again uh, we were not disgraced uh, because I believe the Australians at one point must have been sweating. West Indies we batted first and scored I think 160, 163 or 167. So I remember I had already injured my leg very badly I mean uh, against the Australians but I was pushed to play and that you know kept me in a position where I would not have to do much running. So I remember at lunchtime as I was stretching and I was with, with Tito and, uh, and Tariq and I said look, I mean why don't we each guess how many overs these guys will get the runs because there's only 166 so you know everybody gives their own numbers and so we were just joking around. Raja Bali and Martin Suji opened the bowling. Oh, great goal by Raja Bali and Richie Richardson is out. And then the third ball. That's out! That is out! Brian Lara has been dismissed. It bubbled around in the gloves of the wicketkeeper Iqbal. But Brian Lara runs too often, flirting outside that off stump. And aren't the Kenyans happy? Obviously, they don't want to take any kind of a chance at this stage he's given it Port Nawaz isn't very happy but he has given it Kaiser Hyatt the umpire so Weston is losing 9th wicket 89 for 8 Weston 89 for 9 Weston Beach That's it. Inside head onto the stumps. Cameron Coffey goes. That's the end. The Kenyans are elated. They are dancing. All of them collecting stumps. Well, not all. There are only six stumps, and they have got to left to leave the stump camp. So there are only five stumps to be collected. Very, it was very, very interesting because, especially for us, in quotes of being of African origin, because we always look forward for West Indies. Is like we we were always adored West Indian cricketers, and for us, beating them on the. And it would have been great for them if they had beaten Zimbabwe. They would be sure of qualifying for the quarterfinals, Chris. It was excitement all over. I mean, even my pain had gone because you know we did a, a, a round of circle, and I didn't even realize that my pain is gone because I was jogging along with the team. We were in an ecstasy. At the time of the victory, no, remember people were working. It was as if we were in the stadium. It was madness here. It was an unbelievable day. Well, it's like, uh, you know, 
the national football team, the Arambe Stars, beating Brazil at a World Cup tournament. Nobody dreams about that. We won one of the biggest upsets uh, regarded uh, in international uh, sports, not only cricket, when we beat the two-time world champions West Indies in 1996. That particular win opened the doors to for Kenya cricket. Kenya was two and a half hours out behind and all of a sudden the entire community and well-wishers of the family were, were uh, coming to his shop because they were still working and they were two and a half hours behind. Right. And people were just pouring in to con congratulate him and obviously I'm sure it must have been a great feeling. Where you had uh, ballers like Shane Warne, Murli Dharan, Komble, Wakar Yunus, Wasim Akram, Magra, then you see Asif Karim uh, being fourth in the, in the averages. It was unbelievable. We had agreed with Nazan that after the World Cup, I was going to call it a day, you know, because it's enough. 96. 96 that, you know, it's enough because it's been so many years of traveling and there were other commitments. When I come back to, to Kenya, and so I said, okay, well, I think now it's time to call it a day. She says, no, 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 we'll continue. There's no need to continue because the feeling was so good. But on, on a sad note, I think this is where the KCA did not take the opportunity. This was the second great opportunity to have taken cricket to a new level. But they should have at the same time made the administration professional as well as create a good developing structures because the Tikolos and the Odumbas and the other players are going to phase out over time what's coming in. After the World Cup, Asif and Nazneen went on the Hajj pilgrimage. Upon returning, Asif opened a new office for his company. But how did Asif's business manage in his absence on these long tours? Actually, before he left, he used to tell us to, to work as a team. It actually functioned because uh, one, uh, there, there, is, there is a dedicated team which uh, was taking all the initiative of seeing the companies running well. Later that year, they were blessed with a second daughter, Zainab. Once again, the Kenya captaincy came up for Asif Karim. It wasn't easy. Asif, uh, on merit basis, uh, there was no question about his uh, merit to become a captain. I took it as an honor. Uh, I mean, to lead a country is always, to play for a country is an honor. To lead is a bigger honor. I mean, you had, you had Asians and Africans. You had educated and uneducated people. Then you had in the Asians, you had the Hindus and the Muslim. Then you have the Africans, you have the tribes and his own. So now to put all that together and to lead needed an extra uh, head on that. This was followed by the Coca-Cola trophy in India. Coca-Cola was another uh, great. We went without a coach. We had no coach. For us, it was an opportunity to play uh, big cricket. Mahanti's ball, a good line. Just... Well for the captain, Asif Karim, replacing Mohamed Sheikh. Sorting rather to his 50. Oh, and he's bowled him! First ball up for the captain of Kenya, Asif Karim, and he has bowled. Rahul Dravid, and that really did come as a surprise, and Dravid is furious. He's going to be miserable, and this is really unfortunate. The ball just held. I don't know if it's in the rough probably, as you can see, it's kind of what it's delivered, but just held there. Rahul, who was well said, went for his favorite on drive. I remember when I went with Azhar to toss the, uh, the coin on the middle, the temperature then was 54 degrees. We won the toss and batted first. And you know, we, we, we really batted well. We scored over 250. When we went into the field, I knew I was going to open the, uh, the bowling. He came to me and said, Joseph, let me first take the first two of us, then you come into build. So actually it took a lot of pressure. We we're talking how well the Indians have improved or the Kenyans have improved as this tournament has progressed and they've done it without the assistance of a coach they've had to do it on their own which um, is very noteworthy now he started the bowling he opened from the pavilion end to everyone's surprise it was a ploy that worked he bowled just three overs came back for another spell so this is his third spell from the station end 
and he's done a very good job. And they've looked in command of the situation. It's knocked away on the onside for a single. Bold tight lines and length against uh, top Indian batsmen Sachin Tendulkar, Muhammad Azaruddin. And you know, we stifled their scoring. You know, Asif bowled beautifully in that game. You know, his field placing, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the way he was changing the bowling around. I think that is what made us uh, win that game, to be honest with you. It was a famous victory. Kenya beating India for the first time in India. You know, you, you could imagine. The crowd went quiet, you know, playing in front of 30,000. It was a great second major win for Kenya in India. They make up our presentation party, but first of all, I'd like to call up the losing captain, the captain of Kenya, Asif Karim. Asif, uh, disappointment for you today. What disappointment, we were playing against a very formidable side and I want to congratulate the Indian team for winning the tournament today. I would like to take this opportunity to thank BCCI and I think I'm talking on behalf of Bangladesh also for having invited us here and to give us this opportunity to play this big tournament. The team returned home to enjoy a spell with their families before the MCC tour of Kenya. In March 1999, Asif led Kenya to their first ever victory over the touring MCC team. Soon after, the big test of the ICC World Cup was held in England. We are now going to England in, in late spring, early summer. End of April, May. Is The conditions are extremely tough. The preparations were here in Kenya simply because uh, the association had no money. We used to rely on our spin attack. From the 50 overs, over 30, 35 overs were controlled by the spinners. Now here was a case that was not possible. Because your fingers were numb because of the cold. So that's why you needed to keep them in the pocket at, you know, most of the time. Or you know, keep on blowing onto your fingers so that you, know, you keep them warm. And now two of their frontline bowlers are injured. It could be a very tight contest this one. 27 years of age, born in Nairobi, made his debut against Kandy. Sri Lanka went on to win the sixth World Cup. India, about 270. He's been batting well, uh, Rahul Dravid. I remember playing. Uh, Kenya playing India in, uh, in Bristol. Asif was, uh, you know, it was the same level with uh, Sachin Tendulkar in terms of composure and, uh, and leadership, uh, you know, Ganguly, he was in the same league. So really I've seen Asif, Asif grow in the game and I say he's a great leader. I think we've had a fair tournament. Uh, we have uh, scored well against the big boys. Uh, most of the matches we have scored over 200. It's a bowling department that has been a little weak and hopefully when we go back we're going to do a lot of work in that. But when we got back, uh, I felt that the administration did not give me the comfort. They were looking for something and, and I think I played a smart one because instead of being kicked out or being uh, create, giving a, 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 a not an honorable exit, it is better I come out. I remember in, uh, when Asif said he was going to retire, he called me up and he was asking me what do you think about this decision? How should I you know, announce it? Should I call for a press conference or should I issue a statement? And I remember telling him that there's still a lot in him. It was too early for him to retire. Before going to the World Cup 1999, I had contemplated to retire from international cricket after the World Cup. However, I was requested by a number of national cricket officials to rescind the decision until after the World Cup is over. After having captained Kenya at the World Cup, I reviewed the issue of retirement with my parents, family and well wishes. And I have decided to retire from international cricket. Yes, if retiring as captain, it puts it even into a more precarious position. India naming their team today for the Four Nations, and I believe South Africa also about to name their team. Why is it uh, taking so late for Kenya to name the team, and yet, as it were, we are the underdogs? In the light, in light of uh, Asif's retirement. Mm -hmm. Yes, what has happened? Uh, we were waiting for the new selectors to 
by the association. I tell you one thing, after the press conference, it was one of the most challenging time for me. I actually became sick uh, because it was something I was giving up after 20 years. Uh, and I was giving up not because I wanted to give up, because I was made to give up. And I could still uh, take this team to, because that was a critical stage because we had just gotten into international cricket. But if the system was not there to support, it was better that I felt that I come out. For me, I thought it was the wrong time because uh, I felt uh, we still needed him. At that time, there were no youngsters coming through to, to replace the seniors. He was at his peak. He was bowling well. It was an important decision, but he really, he really had a, what do you call, a depression type of thing for that. You know, he really had a what's the withdrawal symptom for not going to play sports. It's like leaving something you love. I still feel very disappointed that most of our cricketers, with the likes of Morris, Steve, Thomas and a few other cricketers who have been great ambassadors to, to our country, in the sporting country, have all left in a very disappointing knot. Asif Karim, who successfully captained the Kenya national cricket team for a number of years before retiring last year, seemed to have settled down to a more sedate lifestyle. Well, at least that's what we thought. Not so. Sports Monthly, whose first copy has already hit the streets, is a publication touching on all sports, including his favorite sport, cricket. Karim invited the five-time world cross-country champion Paul Tergat to the launching ceremony. Tergat already publishes a bi-monthly issue of the Athlete magazine. I realized that if I start a sports magazine, maybe that would help in my contribution to sports. So in 2000, we launched it and was very kind uh, by Paul Tergat, who was the guest of honor, to, to co-launch it with me uh, in that magazine. And since then, we've been running this magazine. I can say that um, the book is very, very passionate about the sport. Uh, he's passionate of what he believes in. And also, he wants to read more to other young and upcoming sportsmen in this country. Using the sports magazine, is able to read masses. A year after his retirement, Asif made his debut as a television presenter and cricket commentator. During the ICC knockout tournament in Nairobi, I did a TV show with him in, uh, on NTV. I had never done anything. It was a live show and I just took the plunge to, to do the highlights uh, for the night. Welcome to the highlights of the first semi-finals between New Zealand and Pakistan. Before we get into the highlights, I'd like to welcome to the, to the studio my guest this evening, Chris Florence from the BBC Radio World Service. This is Asif who's never done broadcasting before, but he came out as a very good anchor. And I had different guests that come in, and even uh, Ganguly was very kind uh, to come one of the nights to you know, talk about the Indian cricket and his experience with Kenya cricket. In 2001, Asif organized a cricket match to help the victims of the massive earthquake that occurred in Gujarat in India. My ancestors are from Gujarat. A terrible thing has happened in India. Cricket would be a good way to raise, because everybody is now starting to talk about how we can raise some money to, to help the people. And uh, I took the initiative of speaking to my good friend, uh, the former Sri Lankan captain Arjuna Ranatunga. And on the first phone call, he willingly supported the, the project. And uh, he flew for the game. We raised well over a million shillings. In 2002, they were blessed with their fourth child, Imran. Asif's attention remained focused on his business, but Kenyan cricket was beginning to miss him. When we were selecting a team for 2003, we had a gap in the batting and we had a gap in the bowling. The call was made on, in my opinion, what was the requirement and what was the need for the team. And he says, I want you to, and, and, and I was gasping to what he was going to say, he says, I want you to be in the team for the World Cup. So I asked him, in the team as what? I said, the team needs you back. I have not played international cricket since my world, last World Cup. I played occasionally club cricket, you know, just to keep myself going and just to, you know, keep in touch. He says, it doesn't matter. So long as you are in the team, for us that is more than enough. So he's telling me, are you just joking with me or... I said, no. I'm a friend. I could joke with you, but now I'm not joking. I'm telling you, honestly, the country needs your services. Are you available? I mean, I was silent for a while, not knowing whether I should react happily, whether I should react uh, sadly, or am I asking myself going into bigger trouble here? 
So I said, I need to think about this. He was reluctant, to be very honest. He says, I don't know. I said, I have the confidence. And then I just asked myself, you know, in 99, what happened? Where are we now? But then again, it came to, look, my country requires me. The, the, that comes well above everybody else. If they feel that I'm required, I've got to put everything aside and I'll do my best of my ability. I told him, look, there's a lot of things I need to sort out. He says, you, you, we are confident that you're capable of sorting it out. And if he wanted to massage my ego, he really did it that night. Okay, So he did that and, and I said, okay, I need to go back at least discuss domestically. We had made a decision and we thought we'll stand by it. But he, went, he wanted to play, it's fine. He went for it. All the teams had gotten together in the vessel in 2003 uh, overlooking the table mountain for a group photograph and all that. So I bumped into Dravid there and he says, oh, hi, Asif. I said, oh, hi, how are you? I think, okay. He says, well, welcome to welcome. I said, well, I'm lucky. What else can I say? You know, so it was interesting that, that the observations that come from international cricketers, so they were also aware of what was happening in Kenya cricket. Australians were 100 and I think 105 for two in, in 15 overs. Right. We had just scored about 170, so you know was, they were just just butchering all the all the ballers. Asif Karim coming into the attack, bowled quite well in the last game. Five wickets in an in innings on one occasion. Whoa, that spawn! That spawn! That is a terrific delivery because it not only did it spin, but it spun quickly. Adjustment from Ricky Ponting, and he's very lucky. Sharp chance, by the looks of things. Watch this turn, it just opens him up beautifully. Had to light adjustment, did it carry just? To the left hand, Hitish Modi. Oh, he's having a little bit of trouble. He's bowling a good line to him. He's having to open up to play it on the leg side, then it's spinning away. That's got to be out close. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well bowled. Quicker delivery after having spun a couple. Fizzed in the quicker ball. Caught the skipper by surprise. Asif Karim retired after the last World Cup, brought back into the team and have a look at this, excellent delivery, pitched in line and carried on with the arm, beating Ricky Ponting and he was sure Karim that was out. Steve Buckner as usual says out and then signals out, 109 for 3. I come into the ball and I bowl the first one to Ricky Ponting and he just plays me down. The second ball, I bowl turned a lot, it beat him, got an edge, it was dropped in the slips. And I said, hey, this is looking good here for me. Because I was enjoying myself, I was not under any pressure. And this was the third time I was playing on King's Mid Ground in, in Durban. First time I played in 95, then in 97, and this was the third time. And every time I bowled there, this is, I realized it later, I had very good records on that ground. So when, when I bowled that second ball, and I saw him struggling, I realized there's a turn on the wicket. So I kept the pressure on, bowling a good line, and every ball he struggled, uh, ponting. And then on the fifth ball, in fact, after the second ball when he was dropped, and I came back, Buckner was smiling, you know, we were smiling at each other. Uh, this is like telling me bad luck, you know, because that's a prize wicket to get. So on the fifth ball, I said, let me try him the arm ball. And I come in and deceived him with an arm ball, and then, then the rest was history. I mean, you get a, a player that, that has been dominating cricket uh, for a lot of years um, and uh, really it was a pleasure to to get Ricky Ponting. Lost the same amount of wickets though. Oh. Well fielded. Usually a very good fielder, Colin Zabuya. Oh. Well, he showed Ricky Ponting that he can spin it. Kareem now is showing Darren Lehman that he can. 
And he's got a slip in place for the one that goes on with the arm. That's what normally happens. You bowl one that really turns a lot, surprises the batsman. The next one goes on with the arm, looks for the turn, and nicks it to slip. Late luck. Late luck. It's gone. Very good bowling. Very thoughtful bowling. He spun one where Lehman had to adjust. Then he lets it just go on with the arm. And Darren Lehman, having seen the one before spin, allows for that. Gets a little outside edge. Nicely taken by the keeper. Kept his presence of mind. Stayed down. Straight in the gloves. A little wobble here. Out for two. 117 for four. The next came in uh, Darren Lehman. Again, a formidable record uh, that he has. And again, deceived him with a quicker ball, got him caught behind. So at one stage, I bowled two overs, two maidens, three wickets for zero runs. And I ended up bowling up to the, the last over. It was, at one stage, it was eight overs, six maidens, two runs, and three wickets. That's gone again. Three wickets for Asif Karim. What's happening here? 18 overs, 117 for five, and it's been brilliant bowling by Asif Karim, 59 years old, changing the pace beautifully. Quicker ball followed by another slower delivery, which has gone straight back to him. Second ball. The crowd are ecstatic. So are the Kenyans, and you can understand why. 117 for five. I remember before Sif bowled the last over, I was shouting from the changing room, don't bowl the last over, because they got one or two runs of that last over and they spoiled the record. Otherwise, it would have been the best bowling ever in the World Cup. Well, bowled again, beautifully bowled, another maiden. Australia stay on 165 for five. Even Steve Bopner is impressed. Deep down my heart, when I finished my eighth over, I was praying that the game gets over because they only needed four runs, so there was no point in me bowling. That, in cricketing's angle, I was a little selfish for the first time thinking on those lines. Scores are tied. And that's it. Full toss it through the wide mid on region by Ian Harvey. And Australia have gone on to win this game in the end quite comfortable because, of course, they have still got another 18 overs and four balls to go and five wickets in the hutch. Thoroughly enjoy themselves, Kenya. It's a great heart from that performance against the best team in the world, Kareem, with fabulous figures. 8.2 overs, six maidens, three for seven. He might just have a chance, a man of the match. Brett Lee with a hat trick will be up there. Adam Gilchrist with 67 runs in 43 deliveries. He's got a stump, so he should have. They've had the moments in this game here. They certainly have. They're just rocking for a time, Australia. Associate member, not the test playing nation yet. They've done themselves no harm at all. They have beaten three test playing nations in this 2003 World Cup and they can rightly call themselves the champions of Africa. They are the only African team left in this tournament and they are going to the semi-finals. Uh, Karim acknowledging the applause from this crowd and certainly bowled beautifully here tonight. And they well appreciated it. Well, he's got the ball as well, he's got a ball, he's got the stump and he'll get the congratulations of the Australians. And now the man of the match. Uh, there was a little bit of debate, there was a hat-trick from Brett Lee as Ricky Ponting mentioned, but the man of the match to receive the goal watch from Barry Richards is Asif Karim. <laughs> Asif. Magnificent spell of bowling. 8.2 overs. Was it three for eight? Yes. Was that all part of your plan? 
Well, I think it's one of those wonderful days I had and uh, when I came in when the Australians were very much in a commanding position. And uh, when I started bowling, I saw that there was turn on the wicket and there was something uh, on the wicket. So I was varying my bowling and fortunately for me and with the grace of God, I had a wonderful spell. Well, you certainly varied your bowling very nicely. You changed your pace well. I noticed you also bowled a couple of deliveries from well behind the stumps. Plenty of experience there, right? Eh? Well, with, with 20 years uh, in the back, I, I better use that experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've retired once already. What was that all about? Now you're back bowling beautifully. Well, I retired after the 99 World Cup. I thought I had served the country uh, quite well, and there were some other domestic matters and businesses to handle. But the board uh, asked me to come back for the World Cup. And, of course, I found it as my duty to come and serve my country and in whatever capacity they need me. Well, you've only played three games in this World Cup so far. Are we going to see more of you in the next, well, the next week or so? Well, next week is going to be very interesting, and uh, I hope I'm in the lineup next week and uh, hopefully do the job again. Well, mate, we wish you all the best for sure. You bowled beautifully tonight. Congratulations and good luck on Thursday. Thank you very much. You know, he put Australia at that time number one team in the world on the back foot. Like, you can't believe it. So, you, you know, our point was proved. And we were we, selectors, especially myself, uh, we were very proud. In athletics, uh, it's like, uh, you know, running the 100 meters in uh, nine point something after you've come out of retirement. Or in football, is like uh, scoring three goals in a World Cup semi-final when you're out of retirement. So it, it was really a phenomenal, you know, bowling spell. I remember that well because I, I got part of the tournament during the hockey tournament. So I was watching it. But then when he took his first wicket against Tricky Ponting, I called everyone to the room. And then from there we just, yeah, the atmosphere was amazing. Until, and we watched it until he was announced the man of the match. Me, Mum and Irfan were watching it on TV, you know, back then we were recording it on the tape, you know, the VCR tape. And he got, he got someone out and then eventually got Ricky pointing out and we were like jumping all over the place like, oh my gosh. People remember a lot of defining moments in life. This incident is equally remembered. Uh, well, if you talked about the World Cup 2003 in Kenya, Nobody forgets this incident. After the World Cup, Asif finally retired from competitive cricket, the sport that had brought him so much joy and honor. I used to live in Mombasa. The sports in Mombasa was very limited, so we had to travel regularly to Nairobi to play the junior tennis, the senior tennis, the cricket was uh, nationally played in, in Nairobi. So I had a huge support from my family and then of course after I got married, my wife equally supported me very, very uh, strongly. Uh, and and uh, without that support, it would be virtually impossible to play at the level and for the period, for the time that I played for 23 years for the country, your family support is paramount. A few weeks later, Asif was called to Sharjah to do commentary on television. And so is Asif Karim. Uh, Asif, let me ask you about Kenya yesterday. First time in Sharjah, never easy. And Zimbabwe, although they won, they had a bit of a scare. Yes, I think Kenya was very competitive yesterday, having posted uh, 225, though we felt they were about 15, 20 runs short yesterday. But they came back fighting all the way and really brought the game to the wire. As Kenya faded from high-level international cricket, so did Asif's career as a cricket commentator. By this time, their father, Yusuf Karim, was not keeping too well. When Asif did so well, so, so well in South Africa, and the very next morning I called him, uh, he picked up the phone, I knew he was there, but I could not understand why his voice didn't re relay much emotion or recognition. It's only later on I realized 
that he was struggling with Parkinson's. Growing up, their sons and daughters all represented Braben in various sports. Irfan already had his sights set on the Kenyan team. I remember as a kid I would play him on the, on the garden where we were staying in Westlands and then take him to the club and bowl to him and all that and you could see that the guy had the neck. And I always remember my games at Preben because we were so competitive and we enjoyed all of them. Every match of his at uh, Braben school, uh, cricket, whether it was under 9 or under 10 or under 12, I would religiously make sure that I was there to watch him. When we played against uh, Braben, the, this, uh, where uh, Irfan goes to study, I saw uh, his son play and I called as if straight away, I said, as if you have given birth to a lion, a lion cub. He says, what are you saying? I said, yes, your son is going to play for Kenya at a very early age. By 2006, Asif and Nazneen's businesses had transformed into the Safinaz group of companies and moved into their own premises in Lavington. Insurance is, is the main business that I, I am in and the public relations uh, in, in the service industry is very, very important. Uh, and so we are doing a very difficult business. Asif loves business and he loves, he loves talking about all sort of how you invest money, how you put in money, and you talk for hours and hours and hours. He's my role model, uh, because immediately after that, uh, when he retired, he went to business. Because it is easy to make money, but also it's easy to, to lose money. Uh, if you don't know how to invest well, yes, and uh, he has given me also opportunity as a person to learn from him how to be able to invest in my own. He understands business, uh, that I have seen it. He has some, uh, you know, business sense. And you know, you know Asif Karim, where is he now at the moment? The assets, the status, you know, Asif was not that big when I saw him 10 years before, 11 years before. He has a lot of, you know, uh, I say business acumen. He understands that uh, this is the thing, if I do, I can earn money, I can earn status, etc. In December 2008, a very unwell Yusuf Karim was finally honoured by the All Africa Federation of his community. In 2009, Asif Karim was elected as chairman of the Ithnashari community in Nairobi. I remember sitting down in the first meeting that we had at the community. And so he's now the new chairman and, you know, it's a new team. And then he laid out a year plan. He said, we are going to meet on this date in February, this date in March, this date in April, this date in... And I think everyone was taken aback and they were like, this man has just planned out the whole year. Then he listed down about 15 or 16 objectives, aims, goals that we were going to achieve. And suddenly, your mind would start realizing that he wasn't doing this to be the chairman of the community. He actually had a vision. Sadly, in March 2009, Yusuf Karim breathed his last. My life to chair to make it again. Company guy. Go this time, so we make it from Gurma. Bali be wheelchair ma ata po manim che che baju ma be touch. Haji manim thay ke suit touch. Go this manim ma aku le to jong. E u thay je. First thing in the morning, he gets up at six. He makes a list of everything to be done. He ticks it as the days go along. You have to feel his grip. You shake hands with him. You start wondering. And I learned to do that because of him. While still in school, Irfan was playing cricket for the Kenya team. It was my debut against Andhra Pradesh when Kenya took them on in a three-day game. Uh, and. Uh, we had been hit all over the park for about 500 runs, I think. I came in and I saw the day off, the, the day, and I finished on about seven not out. 
But then, uh, as as uh, the day went on, I found myself staying at the crease, getting getting runs easily. And uh, at the end of it, I finished on 104. I got caught uh, at extra covers, but I made my first century for the national team. And I think that was what changed changed everything for me, because that led to me being given a national contract. Asif added further credentials by qualifying as an arbitrator and also continued to be a vocal advocate of the government's role in sports. You look at the way the ministry is at the moment. You have a ministry of youth and culture and blah, blah, blah. And then at the end comes a small word called sports. How can a beautiful country like Kenya that has produced world stars over the years from athletics to football to cricket to tennis cannot have a ministry of sports on its own? There is something seriously wrong. And it's high time now with the new dispensation hopefully coming in 2013 that the government then must ensure that we have a ministry of sports on its own with a huge budget and have a ministry of sports that can handle who knows what the value of sports is because to me it's a multi, multi-billion dollar industry and it's important that we take sports seriously. Fatima Karim graduated from Warwick University and Imperial College London with a Master's in Civil Engineering. She has represented her university and community in football, netball and tennis and actively fundraises for various charities. Her younger sister, Zainab, continues to represent Braben in sports, publishes a magazine and enjoys adventurous outdoor activities. In addition to this, she has a story published in a collection of short stories in the London Library. Imran is an active golfer and plays cricket, rugby and hockey for Braben School. He is also quite the technology expert. Irfan joined Loughborough University and began making his mark there. In UK there are nets everywhere and you can sort of go and practice with a friend and you can practice for hours and hours. Any busman who can pick the fielders, can pick quick wickets and he hits the ball hard, I think he's the future of this, of this country. If, if he's nurtured well, if he gets proper coaching. Ifan Karim, the wicket keeper for Kospeke, is quite an influential batsman for them. So he, he's, the he's the danger man. There he is, you can see him there. The danger man for Kospeke. Oh, immediately, straight away through the covers. Four runs. Good shot. Good shot. Daula, what are you to start from, from the little... Oh, that, that's the father. He loves that shot either. He's not, he's not moved at all. He's danced. And there he goes. He found Karim off the mark in style. Good guy. The good thing with him is tall, so he stays right on top of it. Punches it through the through the cover point. And guess what? I'm sitting next to the legend. And this is called Karim's corner, it looks like. I see father, son. You and yourself, not known as a batsman, known as a bowler. Your son, batsman, two different departments. What we what sort of wisdom do you give him? Well, I think he comes uh, from my father, who used to be a renowned uh, coast uh, batsman. Uh, regarded as one of the best batsmen the coast has produced. So obviously, maybe he's got the genes from there. These are the innings you remember. It's a grand final. Oh, and he gets four runs to finish the game. And that's there, and he punches there, and he puts the bat. Good batting, it's five, it's five. and that's the mom. She's really, really happy to see the son performing. There's the dad, Asif Karim. Time for the man of the match, and it's been a unanimous decision. Kospe Kays, Irfan Karim. If Irfan Karim can come up and get the, the man of the man trophy, and to give it to him, it's Tom Ticolo, chairman, NPCA. Tom Ticolo will give the man of the match award to Irfan Karim. A magnificent knock today in from the beginning. Irfan, um, I think you should stay here because you are also the player of the tournament. Alpes Vada, chairman selector, Cricket Kenya will give the award to Irfan Karim for the player of the tournament. He's been fantastic so far.
Well, uh, there you have it, Irfan Karim. 50,000 Kenyan shillings coming your way. Man of the match and player of the tournament. Irfan, if you could just uh, come this way and uh, have a little word with me. Well, uh, there you go, Irfan Karim. You said from the beginning that you wanted to get runs and, y and you did it. Uh, everything worked out for me today. Um, starting from starting from the from the first ball, I felt that I, I could play through the innings, and uh, all, all all went well. And uh, I think the others supported me well, Maurice Oma and uh, Mishra. So I think it was a good win all, all, overall. Well, uh, player of the tournament as well. You you've had a fantastic tournament. Trying to look now not on an individual basis, but more on a Kenya team basis to try and work well with the team, and hopefully we can start winning more matches and hopefully qualify for the 2015 World Cup in Australia. Yusuf Karim's achievements are immortalized by this road named after him in Mombasa. As the achievements of his family spread across the sporting world, who knows how they will be remembered in the years to come.